A warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 16th of January. Now, I've just started my analysis of the Westminster Hall debate, just finished about half an hour ago uh, in the British Parliament. Mr Andrew Bridgen is giving an opening speech on excess deaths. So I'm just going to allow Mr Bridgen to speak for himself just in, in, in entirety. Please give him the time. Mr Bridgen has suffered for his stance. He's been ostracised and criticised all over the place. He's lost his party membership. And coincidentally, today, he was offered a plush trip to Davos, which I believe is a place in Switzerland. But he didn't. He stayed at home and represented the British people. Now, let's give him the time, please, and listen to his points. You decide if he's following the evidence. Order, order. Andrew Bridgen to move the motion. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Sir Gary, and it's always a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I would like to th start by thanking the Backbench uh, Business Committee for scheduling this debate and to the 17 colleagues from across the House who supported this application for a debate on the trends on excess deaths, following on from my adjournment debate on the 20th of October on the same issue. Uh, Sir Gary, the, uh, the eyes of history are upon us. Every generation looks back in wonder at the incredible mistakes of our forebears. They will ask questions such as how could they possibly realise how, how, how wrong they were? What on earth happened to them? Why did they ignore the evidence for so long, their values and every opportunity to learn from the mistakes of yesteryear? What madness captures men? From 2010 to 2019, Annual death rates in England and Wales oscillated between 484,000 and 542,000. In 2020, there were 607,000 deaths, 65,000 more than the maximum in 2018. In 2021, there were 586,000, which is 44,000 more than the 2018 figure. After such a rise, there should be a deficit. A significant deficit, in fact, because sadly, our most vulnerable and elderly, who might have lived a while longer, were taken from us early. Mm -hmm. But in 2022, there were 577,000 deaths in England and Wales, and in 2023, 581,000. A huge rise when, in fact, a significant de deficit would and should be expected. The deficit, and then some, has been filled not with the extremely old and the extremely vulnerable, but with others, many, many others, who are often young or in the prime of their lives. You might want to ascribe the excess deaths in 2022 and 2023 to the virus, but that would be a mistake. That's not what their death certificates say, and moreover, there are far too many young people dying. Far from being below the recent polling, uh, rolling average, Excess deaths in 2022 have been above, 6% above in fact. In 2023, when one might expect deaths to finally fall below the average, the excess has also been 6% above. These numbers are higher in the younger age groups. No one with integrity can fail to be troubled by these figures. What actually is going on? And that's what we need this debate for Today. It's a problem that affects us all. It affects every community in every constituency across the country. And uh, I would like to thank all the honourable and right honourable members who've attended this debate today. And I think we need to thank the public for their interest, which has stirred the interest of colleagues. And I'm very encouraged by the turnout for today's debate, which is considerably better than we've seen in the past. Not everyone in this room will be comfortable with analysing scientific data and figures. Um, that is not my position. I was fortunate enough to um, have, take a degree from Nottingham University in biological sciences many years ago, and I specialised in biochemistry, genetics, behaviour and virology. I'll give one on that. Yeah. It's a very important debate he's having. So in 2022, that we saw nearly as many excess deaths across the UK as during the Blitz. And in my own region of Yorkshire, every single year since the pandemic, we have had excess deaths. And my constituents are very concerned by this. But what they're also concerned about is almost a deafening silence from the NHS 
about what is causing this, why it's happening, and what they're doing to alleviate this. So I thank the Honourable Gentleman for bringing this very important debate today, and only by talking about it can we actually get to the root cause of what the issue is, because there clearly is an issue. Well, that's the whole point of a representative democracy. We're here to raise the issues on behalf of our constituents and to look after their best interests at all times. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his attendance, but we had enough signatures for a three-hour debate in the main chamber. We were actually giving a 90-minute debate in, in Westminster Hall, which I did mention to the chair of the Backbench Business Committee. I felt was a bit of an insult, given the gravity of the issue we're debating uh, to those who've uh, lost loved ones over the last few years. And I'd also like to... Th I'll give way. To him for giving in. And he's right to point there is considerable concern about this issue. And due to that concern, does he agree with me that we should be using uh, the most accurate data available and using a data set of the age standardised mortality rates, which takes into consideration growing population and an ageing population? Of course, um, we, we should be using the most accurate figures that we've got. And I, later on in the speech, near the end, I'll be talking about the data that we really want, which could settle this matter once and for all uh, beyond reasonable doubt. So I thank the public for their pressure and their interest in these statistics. And I thank the people who've attended today in person and the thousands and thousands who'll be watching on the television or, or online. There is a burning question Sir Gary, at the heart of this debate. This is, after excess deaths, there should be a deficit. Where is that expected deficit? When will we have it? And worse, why is the deficit not being filled but significantly exceeded? And why are the institutions, whose job it is to notice these matters, to record these matters, to publicise and call attention to these matters, why are they all apparently asleep at the wheel? And the second burning question, which I'll come to first, is why is no one listening to those raising the alarm? The research and analysis of two of Britain's most trusted doctors provides us with alarming clarity. Only this week, Sir Gary, the director of the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford, Professor Carl Hennigan, reviewed, reviewed the causes of excess deaths and concludes that they are predominantly related to cardiovascular disease. He told the Sunday Express newspaper, this cannot be explained by COVID, population growth or an ageing population. Consultant cardiologist Dr. Asim Malhotra, who is a world-leading expert in the causes of heart disease, also told TNT Radio yesterday that even though cardiovascular disease is multifactorial, the top of the list for, in the hierarchy of causes behind excess cardiac-related deaths has to be the experimental COVID mRNA vaccine until proven otherwise. And this is not speculative. No. I won't give way at this, but let me just finish this trial and I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. This is not speculative, but based on the highest level of data which combines plausible biological mechanism, randomised controlled trials, high quality observational data, pharmacovigilance data, autopsy data and clinical data. And those who choose not to acknowledge these cold, hard facts, cold, hard facts, Mr. Sir Gary, are either unaware of the evidence willfully blind or lack a conscience. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way and I'm grateful for uh, shining a spotlight on this important debate about excess deaths but I'm just keen to understand the difference between co correlation and causation because there's a correlation between eating ice cream and sunburn but we don't necessarily assume the two are together. Yeah. It could be sunny weather. The same goes for this case. Is it to do with the fact it's lockdown? Is it to do with late presentation, access to the NHS? These are the key bits to try and understand the causation and correlation to understand why these numbers are so high. I agree with the honourable gentleman. He is a medical doctor, so he does have some knowledge, clearly. Uh, but to correlation is not causation. But correlation is an alarm bell, Sir Gary. And alarm bells are going off all over the building, but no one wants to open the door and see if there's a, there's, a, there's a fire. I believe that future generations will ridicule us for what we've just done in response to a seasonal airborne virus. We apparently lost our collective minds. We've imposed a brand new type of quarantine on a healthy population. In breach of all public, uh, previous public health advice, in breach of our own carefully crafted expert pandemic plan, in breach of flagrant breach, of the sensible and experienced advice from many professionals. Those noble dissenters are being vindicated one by one, inevitably so, as the suppressed, shaming, real-world evidence finally emerges. 
I'm not going to mention those who harass and discredit and ridicule the dissenters. They, they loudly paraded their egotistical virtue on social media, in the press and on television. But I know exactly uh, what harassment feels like. And we inflicted social distancing, masking and school closures on healthy children at no risk from the virus. We did this to protect adults at the expense of our children and their social and mental health. People raised alarm, Sir Gary, but nobody listened. A society that consciously and knowingly sacrifices perfectly healthy children for adults is sick in itself. Our time, this time, will not be an era that's looked on well by future generations. That is going to be our legacy. And I call on this House and those in authority to right this grievous wrong and right it quickly. With unbearable cruelty, we isolated even those who would gladly have made the individual choice to see their grandchildren. And worst of all, we bypassed all the procedures, all the protocols, and all the science to inflict on a healthy population a brand new and untested product that had never before been used outside clinical trials, never mind approved. There was no long-term safety data. The safety analysis in the trials was eight weeks, and, and then the control group was vaccinated. No age stratification for recipients of an, uh, an experimental medication for an illness with an average mortality age of 82. No liability under any circumstances for the manufacturers of these experimental treatments. Furthermore, there were good reasons, based on the science known at the time, why these products might be harmful. Ridiculous future generations may come to loathe us. We will be forever be the poster boys and girls of a society that collectively lost its mind and lost its moral compass. They will hang this millstone around our necks for eternity. And what's the flaw in this human nature that latches on to things and destroys all before it? It's been dubbed by some as the madness of crowds or a kind of mass formation psychosis. The sort of thing that allowed China to commit population Armageddon with a one-child policy for decades. The sort of thing that... Uh, allowed us to have millions, millions of cattle slaughtered during uh, the apparent foot and mouth outbreak where we persuaded, not by the science, but by plausible patter of provable idiots like Professor Neil Ferguson. Yes, the very same. His advice led to the bankruptcy, the immiserization and the utter despair of countless farmers forced to destroy their own livelihoods in a futile attempt to prevent the spread of an airborne virus, a virus that had already managed to pass in the air all the way from France to the Isle of Wight. So how many times must the so-called experts be caught literally with their pants down as their models fail yet again? How long must we be subjected to debunk dribble being dumped in our political discourse? How long must decision makers deal with discredited modelling and moribund and captured institutions? And why will no one listen to reason when they've been proven wrong so many times? And there are plenty of other examples in medicine, from bloodletting with leeches to pointless lobotomies to not washing hands between the mortar and the labour ward. Doctors and scientists are far from immune to groupthink, and the current batch are living proof. I, I'll give way on that point. Uh, to the Honourable General. And this will not be the first, or I suspect the last government in history, not to follow the evidence when it comes to uh, difficulty. But when governments make uh, mistakes and protect themselves and don't uh, look at the evidence, we as a democratic society should expect there to be an inquiry that establishes uh, what has happened and what should have happened and what should happen in the future. Does the honourable gentleman agree with me that the inquiry that we have set up is failing in its task in doing uh, that job, and it is assuming that lockdown was right from the, the beginning. <coughs> I, thank, I thank the right honourable gentleman for that intervention, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. This is not a, a political issue. This is a public health uh, issue that should affect every constituency in the House. I think we know that the so-called COVID inquiry is, uh, has, has already set itself out, the answers it wants to get to. It, it has all the appearance of a whitewash, and clearly <clears throat> it was deeply disappointing this week when they announced that the, the module to do with the safety and efficacy of the vaccines has been put off indefinitely, certainly until after 
the next general election, which is extremely disappointing. And, and another instance uh, I could talk about is, is that I contacted every public and media body I could think of in 2014 to tell them again and again that the sub-postmasters were innocent. But no one listened. And I knew that sub-postmasters in my constituency were completely honest. Anybody who knew these pillars of society knew it. The innocent were falsely accused of dishonesty over the Horizon scandal, and they were relentlessly pursued by a merciless, mendacious, and malicious bureaucracy. And it's the coldness that shocks most, Sir Gary, the imperious arrogance, the mercilessness that captures institutions and cowards in authority when a single narrative closes our collective minds to nuance, to experience, to the inconvenient truths. No one listened to the sub-postmasters. No one cared. No one, in, no one in power moved a muscle to help. But now, all of a sudden, one media programme has shifted the narrative to reveal that the experts were wrong, that our institutions were wrong, that those in authority were wrong, and that an infallible computer system was in fact fallible. Even our justice system got it so tragically wrong with thousands of court hearings and judges making wrong judgments. Will the post office lessons be learned regarding the COVID insanity? So who's actually dying now? Well, it's not the old and frail, as it was with COVID. In fact, the deaths from dementia, a key benchmark of elderly deaths, have been in deficit ever since COVID, as we would expect after a period of uh, high mortality. Instead, particularly for cardiovascular deaths, there's been an incessant week-on-week -week excess mortality for months and months in the young and middle-aged. Every age group's affected, but the 50 to 64-year-old age group has had it worse, and I'll declare an interest. Um, there has been, <laughs> they have been stricken with 12% more deaths than usual in 2022, 13% in 2023, and at least five out of six of those deaths this year have nothing to do with COVID whatsoever. My constituent, Stephen Miller, was a healthy IT engineer in his 40s. He had two doses of AstraZeneca jabs in the summer of 2021 and was ill very shortly afterwards. His side effects were so bad that he lost his job. And in November 2021, he was rushed into hospital and he now has cardiomyopathy and has ventricular failure with a maximum of five years to live, taking him to 2026, unless he has a heart transplant. And when I saw him last, he had a, a resting heart rate of 145 beats per minute. He subsequently has lost his partner and access to his child and is at risk of losing his house. He now has a diagnosis from Glenfield Hospital in Leicester of vaccine-induced cardiomyopathy. And I will help him to try and get the compensation. But he's just one example of one of my constituents who's probably going to have 30 years of his life stolen off him. His child will lose his father. How is £120,000 of compensation possibly adequate for that? And I certainly will. I'm most grateful to my honourable friend for introducing this debate so coherently. But would he be able to explain why Module 4 of the public inquiry into the safety of these vaccines has been arbitrarily postponed from next July. Surely the case he mentions highlights the need for urgent inquiry into this. Um, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise, raise that issue. Why would they put any investigation uh, at the public inquiry, which I think is costing some hundreds of millions of pounds and should be there for the public interest, uh, put that debate back in indefinitely. Um, I fear there has been political pressure placed on the inquiry. Clearly, there's a, a lot of political capital uh, in the run-up to the next election has been placed on the fact that the government and support from the opposition parties did the right thing in our uh, pandemic response, including the rollout of the vaccines. I think that the very fact that they've done this indicates that there is something to hide, and it should make the public extremely suspicious, and I'll be coming on to that shortly. Um, for two years, we turned society upside down so as not to, quote, unquote, kill granny. Now that mum and dad are dying, uh, it appears that no one cares. This is Alice in Wonderland thinking. People in their 50s and 60s, I declare an interest again, normally have more, uh, many more years of active contribution, I hope so, and deeply fulfilling lives left 
to live, and these are the people being hit the hardest. Furthermore, the raw number of lives lost is not the only measure we can look at. We, we have better methods. The most famous method is known as quality adjusted life years. Those who understand public health generally refer to these as qualies. Qualies measure healthy years of life lost and are the most sensible metric for properly assessing the impacts of deaths on lost life on families and on society. Qualies were ignored at the outset. They were ignored in July 2020 when the government's own assessment was that lockdowns would reduce qualies by about, by about a million years. The UK, a million years. They were ignored when deciding to inject the young with experimental vaccines despite the refusal of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation to recommend jabbing under 15s in September 2021. Even at the COVID inquiry, when the Prime Minister tried to raise the issue of quality-adjusted life years, he was shouted down by Hugo Keith, King's Counsel. The lead lawyer at the COVID inquiry, he then revealed his unbelievable, unforgivable, his negligence and his ignorance by saying, I don't want to get into life, uh, quality life assurance models. This, I repeat, is the most senior lawyer at the so-called COVID inquiry. So when I say future generations will ridicule us, it's not hard to see reasons why. The pandemic, a term which some of our best academics from around the globe questioned from the outset in published and peer-reviewed papers, is over. The crisis has passed, yet still empty vessels continue to drown out intelligent, reasoned, expert discourse. Not knowing what a quali means is one thing, but parading his ignorance with arrogant disdain ought to disqualify Mr Keith from any further part in that inquiry. And sadly, his condescending disdain for open inquiry epitomises what many of us have encountered time and time again when raising these issues. We've seen a smorgasbord of fanciful excuses proffered for the rise in heart attacks. Sir Chris Whitty laughably claimed that it was a reduction in statin prescriptions even though prescribing levels were exactly the same. Mm. And it would take years or even decades for changes on that issue to take effect and be seen in population mortality data. The media have tried to persuade us, persuade the people, that eating eggs or the wrong kind of breakfast or climate change is to blame. So, Gary, people are sick of being patronised with these lies. Some have claimed the excess deaths are due to COVID. The literature is littered with studies claiming that COVID causes heart disease. Almost all include COVID cases from spring 2020. It was almost impossible to be tested and become an official case unless you were sick and in hospital. So, Gary, proving that sick people get heart disease more than healthy people does not mean that COVID causes heart disease. Indeed, the claims can be easily debunked. Cardiac deaths have seen a steep rise in both Australia and Singapore, as well as the UK. And these countries did not have any significant COVID until 2022, but they did roll out the jabs exactly the same time as we did in the UK. Correlation does not prove causation. We've already heard it in this debate. But correlation with and without COVID can rule out causation. The excess cardiac deaths were certainly not caused by COVID. Some have claimed that the excess deaths were caused by lockdowns. Well, it's well known that psychological stress increases the risk of heart disease. The government subjected people to a massive propaganda campaign of fear, well documented by Laura Dodsworth in her book, State of Fear. We were cut off from our usual support networks. For many, we saw immense financial pressures. Such policies could contribute to heart disease in a minor way. However, the sharpest rise came later entirely coincident with the jab rollout. So we have a clear temporal link between increased deaths and vaccination. And some have claimed that the excess can't be down to the jabs because Sweden have uh, not had as many excess deaths as elsewhere, despite having a very similar number of doses per million of the experimental vaccines. But it's important to understand that heart disease is a cumulative risk. In the UK, we already have a serious problem with heart disease before the pandemic. And it's just got much worse uh, following the vaccine rollout. And by contrast, Sweden has the longest healthy life expectancy in Europe. It's no wonder that they are a statistical outlier on excess deaths now. If you're under 50 and you live in Sweden, the chances of dying from heart disease are already half that of uh, a resident of the UK of the same age. Some have admitted to the problem, but claimed it was worth it. 
Science journalist Tom Chivers even said regarding jabbing children, it sounds cruel, but a small number of, of deaths would be worth it. As I pointed out earlier, from China through to the UK, any culture willing to openly sacrifice children for adults is rotten, in my view, to its very core. And look what's happening now. Yes, again, we're seeing a peak in COVID hospitalizations, we should be ex when we, 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 as we should be expecting from a coronavirus in January. The number of people infected and the number of intensive care admissions was about the same every six months before and after the vaccinations. The number of COVID intensive care admissions in the January to June of 2020 wave was about the same as the July to December 2020 COVID wave and remained similar in the January to June 2021 COVID wave and the July to December 2021 COVID wave. The jab therefore had no impact whatsoever. And those interested may wish to consult a recent paper in the Journal of Clinical Medicine that demonstrates exactly this point. And the next important factor is, is that Omicron is far less deadly. The reason there are fewer COVID deaths now is because Omicron's arrival at the beginning of 2022. But viral waves will continue to come and go until almost everyone has post-infection immunity. And we're not there yet. It's clear that viral waves were not impacted by lockdowns. It's increasingly clear they were not impacted by the jabs either. People have denied that the viral waves peak naturally at predictable times of year. But how much longer can that be denied? The lockdowns did not cause deaths to decline from their peaks in April 2020 because they also peaked and fell in April 2022 and March 2023 without lockdowns. Indeed, in 2020, infections were already falling before the lockdowns were even started. The actual problem with excess deaths started in spring 2021 with the jab rollout. And there was a stepwise rise in ambulance calls for life-threatening emergencies at exactly the same times. Hospitals started to be overwhelmed also for the first time. And the number of people unable to work because of long-term sickness started to rise. Even mayday calls from aircraft rose. Are we meant to think that this is all a coincidence? When are we actually? We know that these injections cause a range of serious adverse events, especially cardiac events. Now, the excess deaths are the tip of this very ugly iceberg. And we haven't even mentioned the world-shaking scandal of jabbing people who'd already had COVID, which, at a stroke, almost entirely demolishes the credibility of our public health policies at this period. We completely immune, uh, uh, ignored natural immunity. That one fact ought to be a red flag of gigantic proportions, but no one's listening. And I haven't got time to discuss the fact that jab was, was not pulled when it became clear that an incredible one in 800 doses administered led to serious adverse events and consequences. The rotavirus vaccine was pulled entirely after causing an adverse event rate of one in 10,000. For the 2009 swine flu vaccine, it was an adverse event of one in 35,000 that were harmed, and it was then pulled off the market. The COVID jab is still being pushed, and it's seriously harming people. Inevitably, at a rate much higher than one in 800, because most people are being exposed to multiple doses of the vaccine with the, uh, the same risk, adverse event risk, at each dose. Thalidomide, syphilis treatment, all these infamous, appalling, shattering medical scandals are dwarfed by under the iceberg under the water that is the medical scandal we're currently living through, the experimental COVID-19 so-called vaccines. And it took 11 years after the drug was withdrawn in 1961 for thalidomide scandal was first raised in Parliament. 11 years after the thalidomide scandal, before the word thalidomide could even be mentioned in the Chamber of the House of Commons. Well, Sir Gary, I'm not going to let that happen this time. That's why I fought so hard to raise this issue in Parliament at a cost to my reputation, my career, and the financial security of my family. The public inquiry should be urgently looking at this issue. Instead, they're wasting taxpayers' money accessing over WhatsApp messages while people are dying. As if that isn't bad enough, so I've already shared with you, the, uh, we learnt this week, that the vaccine module has been postponed indefinitely for no good reason. It's as if the inquiry is so desperate not to find fault that they can't even look at what's happened with the vaccines. We need transparency. Dr Claire Craig, co-chair of the Heart Group, has been doggedly pursuing the UK Health Security Agency for their record-level data on dosage, dates and deaths for a year. 
This is the data that could sort out this issue once and for all. They admit they've got it. The MHRA admit that all this data has been released to Pfizer, AstraZeneca and Moderna. Yet they claim they cannot anonymise it for public release to the public. A failure to release this data makes it look like there is definitely something to hide. A recent poll in the USA shows that more than half of the public think the vaccines are responsible for a significant number of deaths. If there was nothing to hide, they would certainly release this data for analysis, anonymised, to stop the upswell of legitimate concern. The latest response from the Information Commissioner's office is that Dr. Claire Cray's got to wait another six months at least before a case officer will be assigned to this issue. This is not acceptable, Sir Gary. They've released our health data to Big Pharma, but they won't release it to us. The record data, level data must be released. It is really too much to ask. Is it really too much to ask that the British public be given the same level of access to the relevant data given to Big Pharma companies, those actually responsible for this debacle? Corporations that carefully secured immunity from all legal liability, or in this country, indemnity from the government before dangerously and negligently experimenting on the health of our nation and the world. We're witnesses to the greatest medical scandal in living memory, the consequential fallout in trust, public opinion, and public confidence uh, is only just beginning. Continued attempts to shut down debate, flatten dissent, and obstruct independent analysis can, can only delay the eventual collective shame. It's going to be a reckoning, and we're going to have to try and rebuild trust in our health services, in our media, and in our politics. And uh, we haven't even started on, on that journey. So, Gary, before I was expelled from the Conservative Party for voicing my concerns over these experimental vaccines and the harms that I believe they called, I met with a senior member of the party who, after listening to my concerns about the vaccines and uh, NG163, the midazolam and morphine scandal, told me quite calmly, Andrew, there is currently no political appetite for your views on the vaccines. There may well be in 20 years' time, and you're probably going to be proven right. But in the meantime, you need to bear in mind, you're taking on the most powerful vested interest in the world with all the personal risk for you that that will entail. So, Gary, I refuse to bow to that threat. And as they say, the rest is history. People have alleged that I'm spouting conspiracy theories. Well, I, I think it is a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy against the science. It's a conspiracy of silence. And, Sir Gary, it's a conspiracy against the people. And I will have none of it. Wow. And, uh, well, clearly a lot more to come on that. I'm not going to comment on individual points now. We are going to be analysing this in some detail and we will be thought to thinking about the responses from some of the other members of parliament present but but for now we'll just put this out there this is live on the day so for now uh, thank you very much uh, Mr Andrew Bridgen member of parliament in the United Kingdom